thanks uh, to Brian and Carlo for organizing this excellent conference for the day and for inviting us. This is um, the paper that we're going to present is very much a work in progress. And it comes from a short piece that we wrote last summer, early fall, that came out in uh, Socialist Projects, The Bullet, and then was reprinted in Ravel. And this is the first time we're presenting the paper, so we're, uh, we're looking forward to, to any feedback and comments folks might have. We, um, we also have a new title. This is uh, a last minute change that, that was <clears throat> product of a brainstorm session last night, two nights ago. Um, and we think it's much improved and much clearer to the topic that we're going to speak about, uh, uneven worker power and the populism austerity labor nexus. And so uh, we're dividing up the talk in half. And uh, in the first 10 minutes or so, I'm going to try to introduce this idea of uh, populism austerity labor nexus, if I can. And, uh, and then Steve will go into a little more deeply uh, how we understand that and how that relates to uneven worker power. Um, in addition to thanking the conference organizers, I also want to thank my co-author, Steve Tufts. We've, uh, we've been working on this for a little while and we've been trying to uh, develop the spirit of collaboration and, and cooperation in doing this paper. And that's always an ongoing struggle, so I'm fully expecting him to blame me for any errors in fact and conceptual oversights. Um, you may have, I accept that. And, uh, Looking forward to your comments. Okay, um, as we've been talking about uh, all day today, the, uh, the financial crisis continues to have profound implications for workers uh, around the globe um, as advanced capitalist economies, economies socialize the crisis through bank bailouts, uh, through stimulus spending, and so on. Um, in order to reduce the resulting increased financial debt, governments have embarked on austerity programs. And uh, reducing services, creating downward pressure on public and private sector wages and working conditions. Uh, in this context, organized labor has been confronted with concessionary demands by aggressive employers and unions largely remain on the defensive. Um, as unions are put on the defensive by austerity measures, calls for broader working class organizations from diverse groups on the left have become commonplace. Uh, difficult questions remain around how to build such formations and what role, if any, organized labor can plan their development. And this is where we come in with uh, what we're going to talk about as uh, populism austerity labor nexus. And what we try to do is situate the crisis of organized labor and the, uh, the onslaught of austerity measures uh, alongside uh, rising populist movements. And then we want to try to think about uh, ways in which these may become integrated in various uh, particular uh, local and national contexts. Um, so at the same time as the austerity, the crisis of austerity and uh, the, the difficulties confronting organized labor have emerged, populist movements as, as well have arisen across North America and uh, Western Europe on both the right and the left of the political spectrum as increasing numbers of people grow disenchanted with government action corporate incompetence. And so our paper is really, as I've said, an examination of the nexus between these two things. Um, I should also say that uh, while both of us have spent some time uh, in the past studying things like neoliberalism and austerity and also a uh, crisis within uh, labor movements, the topic of populism is a new one for us. So we're, we're working through this uh, as we go along. The, uh, in the paper, we, we, we provide a, a brief conceptual overview of the politics of austerity and the crisis of labor and then try to uh, flesh out some aspects of populism that we think uh, relate to this context and uh, then situate that within uh, the possibilities and potential for uh, addressing the crisis of labor and, and moving forward. We, um, in terms of uh, scholarly perspectives on neoliberalism and austerity, uh, we discussed several within the paper um, that try to come to grips with understanding the, uh, the implications of neoliberalism and its, its future in terms of um, guiding capital out of the crisis. And as we heard about this morning, there are a range of interpretations uh, in terms of understanding uh, the crisis, austerity politics, and neoliberalism, uh, with some scholars suggesting uh, that neoliberalism uh, may have reached its limits, uh, while others uh, discuss the inherent ability of uh, the capitalist economy to emerge from the crisis through neoliberalism, led by the US, um, but through a, a reconsolidated neo neoliberal project. Um, a third perspective, and one that we, we try to draw upon, um, comes from Neil Smith, uh, who presents, in some ways, perhaps, uh, a middle ground between these positions, uh, arguing that neoliberal experiments of the 70s and 80s um, may be dead ideologically, uh, in the sense that um, the, uh, the policy innovation uh, may be missing. 
um, but in, in fact are still dominant in terms of constructive power for the capitalist class. Um, while scholarly interpretations of the implications of the crisis differ in terms of the outcome and the politics of neoliberalism, certainly there's a general agreement that uh, we are in the midst of increased working class insecurity and uncertainty. And here is the context through which we see the rise of populism coming about. Um, the second aspect of, uh, of this diagram, the uh, crisis in the labor movement, again, there are a, a range of ways of interpreting this crisis. And uh, in the paper, we, you know, we, we do a review of, of some of the scholarly literature on, uh, on unions in crisis. And in the interest of time, I'll, I'll be very brief about that. Uh, but certainly, while some scholars uh, focus attention on uh, growing uh, popular and labor uh, movements against uh, globalization, global capitalism, and so on, um, and can see a rise of working class resistance, in particular in the global south, um, others speak to the crisis of labor uh, as, it, as it reflects internally, in, in particular in terms of the bureaucratization of, of labor organizations, uh, for example, in, in the global north, and suggest that for organized labor to move forward, uh, there must be a process, and to challenge neoliberalism uh, in, a, in a direct way, uh, unions must engage in a, in a wide range of uh, various forms of actions, including community alliance building, uh, anti-concession collective bargaining, and in particular internal democratic reforms uh, as a means to address some of the continued attacks. Um, so, of course, there is this broad literature on union renewal and uh, calling for a variety of reforms, uh, including uh, innovative organizing strategies. And what we argue in the context of this, thanks, um, and I'm going to wrap up here and then, and then uh, shift things over uh, for Steve to talk about populism, uh, what we argue in the context of, of this crisis, uh, the politics of austerity and uh, crisis of labor, um, that there is also uh, this growing uh, moment of populism, uh, both on the right, uh, for example, in movements like the Tea Party in the United States, and on the left, for example, through uh, the Occupy protests. Um, now in the paper, again, we go through various aspects of, of what populism is, and Steve is going to walk us through that in terms of how we can understand um, populist movements and their implications for labor. What we're interested in, in particular, are, first of all, uh, ways in which uh, organized labor um, comes into conflict or must confront populist movements, in particular populist movements on the right, and we can look, for example, at what's going on in the City of Toronto with the Rob Ford administration um, and the ways in which it's engaging in collective bargaining with city workers as an example of how QP uh, may have to be engaging with, with right-wing populism. So that's on the one hand, and then on the other hand, we're also interested in the ways in which um, labor organizations may become engaged with left populist movements and the extent to which uh, unions can become involved in those kinds of movements and the ways in which that may uh, perhaps offer a strategy forward or um, may create some, some new challenges as well. The, um, okay, so in terms of uh, understanding populism, and I know I'm, I'm leaving things uh, a little bit too much perhaps in Steve's hands because he now has 10 minutes and counting to, uh, to explain this nice table, but he made the table, so <laughs> I'm sure he can handle it. Um, what, we, what, we're, what I want to draw your attention to, I guess, is that second column, aspects of populism, uh, and in particular, we've, we've broken it down to, to seven different aspects of populism that we, uh, that we see as being uh, quite central to and related to some of the, the problems confronting organized labor, and I'll just speak to, uh, to a couple of them at the beginning, and then, and, then I'll, uh, and then I'll step aside. But in particular, we look at these, um, uh, and we, we heard two aspects of this this morning, uh, particularly around uh, scapegoating of public sector workers. Uh, which is something that is, is quite prevalent amongst populist movements, um, and also um, this conspiratorial element uh, that, that is sometimes present as well. And again, we can see this in terms of the ways in which, uh, in the current context, uh, public sector workers become caught up uh, in this scapegoating process by perhaps uh, right-wing populist movements. Okay, um, I'm going to stop there, and I'll let Steve take over the rest of the table and uh, walk us through populism.